So he, he carried on for some time, then he met this Swiss lady as he was totally broke. He was in Switzerland then trying to find an account that he had opened years before with some money and he was run out of money. He went to the Indian consulate and said, look, I think I have to go back to India, I'm broke. Yeah. The Swami looked at his little notebook of clippings and he said, oh, you, how did you end up like this? And this lady overheard the conversation and she was a quite radical individual herself, not interested in seeking, but interested in this Indian fellow. Yeah. She said, look, I can make it possible for you to stay here. So he begins traveling with this older Swiss lady. She takes care of him, and he goes every summer to hear J.K. talk in Sonnet. And he continues this examination of himself, and he's talking with the other people who are going to these talks, talking about Jiddu Krishnamurti. Yuji even says in one of the tape discussions that he was, he had written a commentary on Patanjali's Yoga Sutras in the light of Jiddu Krishnamurti's teaching. Of course, that's long lost now. It gives an idea of what his, the level of his fascination, both with the Yoga Sutras and what that may have meant, and with this man's teaching. So here's a guy who's dead seriously pursuing this stuff. He's now lost his family. He's lost his money. He's at the mercy of some lady yeah. who's putting him up. Yeah. As far as I can tell, there was no sexual relationship there. I've met people who claim there was. My sense is it's unlikely. He was yeah. a handsome young 40-year-old man, and she was 65. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And interesting, but not that interesting. No. Anyway, who knows? But yeah, you never know. The parties are all gone now. No way to prove anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he describes being in the tent in 1967 while Jiddu Krishnamurti was dis discussing the comparative mind. And he said, Yuji relates this in a tape with this fellow Heislop in 1968. It's on record there and it's in one of the books. He says that Jiddu was describing his, Yuji said he, it was as if he was describing my state of mind. He said, if you've been listening and following along, you'll experience a silence. And then he said, if there's a silence, how do you know that silence? There's a comparative mind. And Yuji said, I suddenly felt like I've been fooling myself. Yeah. For 40 years, I think I'm in some state. Now I've been pursuing this thing, and now I'm telling myself I'm in a silent mind. How do I know? If I'm calling it silence, that means there's still some entity in there observing all this, so yeah. I'm still caught. And then Jiddu goes on and says, in that silence, there is an energy. And in that energy, there is some action. And But what that action is, you can't know. And no. he says, I guess not, yeah. So he gets up and leaves the tent. And that was the end of the talk. And he went and sat on a bench, and he said what happened was that he, this question went round and round and round and stopped. This, this questioning, what is that state? He said, finally I thought, well, I guess I'm in the state of Jesus or Buddha, or one of those guys. The thing I was always after, yeah. that one thing, here it is now. Now how the hell do I know I'm in that state? Yeah, exactly. So that doesn't make any sense. So then the whole thing stopped. And he went home and apparently went into a, some kind of a situation where he was lying on the couch and this aperture of consciousness, I'm using, I'm painting you a picture now, Willem, from books that I've read. This is secondhand information, tertiary, third hand. <laughs> and he lay there and this thing closed down and he resisted this closing because it felt like the end. He said, it really felt like this is the end of everything and I cannot let that go. Yeah. And it stopped. And then um, Valentine was quite concerned. What the hell is going on with this guy? Because there were symptoms of some other condition. Who's Valentine? The woman, the Swiss lady. Oh yeah, Swiss lady. There were some things happening prior to this, which Yuji was saying, like, you have this energy on his body where his skin would would flare up like uh, sparks. Yeah. And he thought it was his polyester shirt. Yeah. And then he would lie in bed and he would roll around in bed and there would be these sparks. Or he would be taking a bath and it was painful, the electricity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some kind of electrical whatever. 
you know, all these things, I can understand why later he refused to talk about it because it sounds all very, you know, this is the stuff that people want. But this is the magic trick. So anyway, he goes home, basically, sounds like what they describe in the traditional Hindu texts, if you poke through all the nonsense, is that a person will die at some point and be reborn. Yeah. And the death, it sounds like, is when the continuity of thought is cut. That rebooting, maybe, is what happens. This is my guess. It sounds, from his description, the body went into the bow posture, and his friend came over and said, Yuji, what's going on? Because Valentine called this young kid Douglas and said, what's, Yuji's acting very strangely. Can you come over? So he comes over and kind of, Yuji, wake up. What's happening? And he said, Yuji was like, uh, in a kind of daze. He just stared out the window or something. And yeah. what he described is that, look, this is the end of all of the searching will put you in a place where you don't know what's happening. That's why everyone is terrified of it. Yeah, right. And when I hear people tell their little cute story of how they were awakened, or now they're an enlightened being, and yeah, you know, yeah. that they still have their job, and their house, and their wife, and their kids, and their dog, and they go for walks, and they can hold. What's wrong with that? Why do you have to be so severe? Look, if, if all of that shit comes to an end, you think you're going to pick and choose? Like as if you can carry on as if nothing happened. Yeah, right. And you're just going to go out and give a discourse now. Yeah. I, it just is so unconvincing. So when I read this account, and the way he told it was in, a, in a, the most basic way that he could communicate, Yuji attempted from the beginning to the end to make this very simple and clear and not mysterious. Yeah. Look, saying, if the thing stops, this is why people avoid really listening or, or looking at things, because if that stops, it's the end of all of the things that you cherish and all the things you're afraid of. But most importantly, you lose what you think you have, and that's the worst fear you have. Your fear is what drives you. Yeah. You thrive on fear, and if someone were to take that fear away, that's the end of you. So for most people, this is, you know, what kind of sales pitch is that? Why do I want that? Yeah. I want to be happy. I want enlightenment. I want to have a blissful life. Yeah, right, right. So fine. So I give you 20, you give me 25 bucks, I'll show you how to be blissful. Yeah, right. And then they feel like they, whatever you're saying, their hopes are pinned on you. So I don't know if I've answered your question. <laughs> this is close to the description of what, and I think with Yuji, what, what I really appreciated was that he tried his damnedest to make it simple, to explain that clearly. Look, if this does stop, if it slows down and stops, and you first see something clearly for the first time in your life, the futility of what you're doing occurs to you at a molecular level, that's the end of it all. Finished. Yeah. Now that is the clearest, most honest assessment of the situation that I've seen. Yeah. Maybe it just appeals to me, I don't know. But that seems real obvious to me. And the, the reason that there were maybe 10 or 15 people around him at any given time. Yeah. Because the truth is not popular. The fake is very popular. Right. Because it's comforting. You yeah. can turn it on and off. Yeah. You can have your awakening and still have your wife. Yeah. You know, whereas Yuji said, look, if you want to tell me you've had no time, no space, where is the space to fuck that bitch in his yeah. discreet way of putting it? You know, then people carry on about how he's so severe and that's very Victorian and how can you, you know, why can't, because they want to have their toys. Yeah. They want to take all the toys with them when they go. Yeah. And here's a guy, he's telling you the fact is, look, pal, first of all, you're not serious. If you were really serious, you wouldn't be asking that question. You know, I mean, if you look at the facts of Yuji Krishnamurti's life, he put himself in the corner and he was shoved deeper and deeper into that corner until the problem. He said, what do you want? If you want one thing, then you'll find it, you'll get it. But you want at least two. So he wanted one thing 
and he lost everything else. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, the family, the money, all of it. And the thing that's unique about him is that he didn't run around trying to get it back. Right, right. He accepted it. Once it was gone, it was gone. There wasn't even a question of acceptance. Yeah. It wouldn't register on his radar. Yeah. He knew what it meant or what it was, but it didn't matter anymore. It had no, no meaning for him at all. Yeah. People that come, I love this demand for meaning and significance. Because what I saw with him is meaning and significance are your torture chamber. That's exactly what people use to trap you and exploit you and the way you torture yourself for your entire life. It's yeah. this demand for meaning and purpose. Your heart doesn't need any meaning or purpose. It's pumping blood for fuck's sake. Yeah. Your lungs are pumping air. You're a living creature. Yeah. This meaning and significance is part of the machinery that we use to yeah. fly airplanes, you know, drive automobiles, write books, make money. That demands meaning and significance. Yeah. But the body has no need for that. No. And in fact, the meaning and significance which we are demanding is a torture for this body. It's the cause for stress, anxiety, yeah, fear. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, you have to. <laughs> no choice. It's no not choice. even about choosing. I mean, this is the, the amazing yeah. thing to me about meeting Yuji was that it becomes a calibration for all this bullshit. Yeah. Now I understand why those things work the way they do. Yeah. All those silly things you used to say all the time, you know, that seem so simple-minded. Oh, my grandmother said that. Yeah, but did your grandmother live like that? No. Yeah. No. Here's a guy that lived with nothing. Yeah. You know, he had a million dollars in his bank account. And he gave away a hundred thousand dollars in chunks to girls for some ridiculous reason. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Because the money was not an issue for him. No. I mean, you can argue all day long about it, but I saw it. You know, I saw how the guy lived. When I first met him, I wanted to know. I thought I'd photo photograph him for twenty four hours. I always tell this story because it's so significant to me. I wanted to to record this example that I had seen. Because from, really, from the day I heard about the word enlightenment, whether it was Carlos Castaneda or whatever, I read Siddhartha in high school, you know, Herman Hesse's book, and then I went and saw the Zen paintings in the, in the university library, and I would, and I would read the haikus and read stories about enlightened people. And yeah. So where the hell are they? Yeah. What would that look like? Yeah. Are they available anymore? Yeah. The Buddhism didn't attract me, too many rules. I grew up Catholic, it looked like another one. Then Jiddu came along, I thought, well, here's maybe this guy's like a Buddha, you know? Yeah. And that didn't work. So now I meet Yuji, and for, for some reason I'm, I'm just convinced this is what it looks like. So I want to make a record of it. Yeah. That's the first impulse, is like, show everybody. Yeah. Look here. Yeah. Then I thought, well, this is such an imposition. I don't, you know. Photograph the guy for 24 hours. What's the point? Who cares? Yeah, yeah. Well, within three years, he injured himself, and I ended up taking care of him for 24 hours a day for like eight weeks, which is when I started to write that book. So let's go back. You, you went to to um, to um, Switzerland where mm. you saw him, right? And then after you stayed in Switzerland, or what? Or no, I, I went to visit for two weeks. And, and, then, and because of work, I was able to travel like that. Yeah. So then I came back to New York, and then in September of that year, this was July and August. Yeah. In September, I flew to India for a yeah. month. Yeah. I came back. I saw him for one week there. I came back, and then I was completely hooked. Yeah. And then I would work enough, and then I would save money, and I, would, I think the next place I went was to Palm Springs. He goes to Palm Springs. He went to Palm Springs every winter. Okay. For whatever reason. Yeah. And I thought, all right, I'm going to go there. So I saved my money. I went to Palm Springs for two weeks. Then the following fall, he came here to Amsterdam. I think that was 2003. I decided, fine, I'm going there. Yeah. I came to Amsterdam. Then that was a couple of weeks. Then that summer, it started in May. For the first time I had, I sublet my loft on, in New York, and I took three and a half months, this felt insane, 
to spend with him in, in Switzerland. Three and a half months? Three and a half months. Why did, why did you decide to solve for some? Because I, he's so old now. Yeah. And I thought, this is the most interesting person I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, right. I'm so sick and tired and fed up with my life. Yeah. I got nothing better to do. What's better to do than to hang out with this guy? Yeah. To go to parties? To accelerate my career? To work more? To yeah. make more money? Yeah. No. This guy seemed to me the most interesting thing I'd ever seen. And he was old. And I thought, and I liked him also. I enjoyed his company. So I thought, I'm going to get on a plane, I'm going to go to Switzerland, I must be out of my friggin' mind. The first week I was there, I had a fever. I was so anxious. What the hell did I do? Yeah. I'm, hit, I'm sitting around in a room with people that are, like, have belonged to communes, and they're religious nuts. Yeah. And they're strange people, I don't know. They have nothing to do with art. They have nothing to do with anything I'm interested in, except him. Three and a half months of this. <laughs> and on the third day, we were sitting in the room with all these people, and I was joking with him. And he, he, I made some smart-ass comment, and he shoved this table toward me. You know, his, he would sit with his feet up on the table, and he pushed it. And then I thought, oh, all right. So I pushed it back at him. And then he shoved it at me, and then I shoved it back at him. <laughs> then he banged me into the counter behind me. Meanwhile. I wasn't watching all the other people in the room, but I was just joking around with him. I stood up and grabbed the table like I was going to flip it over. <laughs> this is, you know, the way he operated was to get you going and then push, push, push. Yeah. So I went a little, and, and I thought, oh, I, then I realized that the other people in the room were scared. Some of them yeah, were yeah, yeah. crying. Crying. Oh, <laughs> what have I done? I can't behave myself. I put the table and I sat down quietly and I started thinking, uh oh, oh, I need to leave. I got to get out of here. This is stupid. Why, why did I do this? Why did I, why did I come here? I can't even behave properly. The answer to why is always a lie. Oh my God. And these people are crying and they're looking and they must have thought I was some monster. Yeah, and yeah, I yeah, felt yeah, like yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. And the next day I came in very sheepish, you know, and and he was kind of sitting there on the other side of the room, and I was waiting, thinking, okay, I can always get a train back and get a flight, go back to New York, and this will be over with. And then, but why should just relax? <laughs> so I relaxed, and then, then it was over. You know, at some point it was over, but this business of joking with him eventually escalated. And I began, he was pushing more and more. He saw me do an imitation of someone once, you know, like imitating how somebody behaved. And then he wanted me to do it all the time. <laughs> and then singing songs, and then he pushed it, and he wanted it all the time. <laughs> like a little kid with a new toy. Yeah, 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 yeah. And pushing me, pushing me, pushing me all the time. And that started something that uh, eventually wound up with him. This, within a year, then he started smacking me on the head and pinching and punching, and then it would go on and on and on. We would, uh, anyway. <laughs>